Hello and welcome back to Genesis Designs and Monocraft and welcome to the Mini Art P47D and isn't that some cracking box art? It's beautiful, isn't it? So, Mini Art. Beloved of armor modelers around the world and specialists in having many, many sprues in each kit. <laughs> uh, this is their first aircraft model and from the CAD and the shots that I've seen online, looks really impressive so when it uh, it came into stock uh, locally I immediately asked so Andy Hills has sent me this from Antics in Bristol he sent this over in the post before he departed for the Telford model show because I was unable to go to Telford I asked him to send me one and he did and here it is so excited to see how this looks in the flesh so let's get into it it is a very big box for a 48th scale world war ii fighter this is the basic kit uh, mini art are going to release uh, a, a, an advanced version as well which will have more detail photo etch and what have you um, this one can be had for around about the 35 pound mark in the uk the expert edition or whatever they're going to call it is going to cost something over 50 which is quite a lot for a 48 model 2 fighter 35 for the basic isn't too bad now i did i did take this out of the bag there's quite a lot going on in here straight away this is quite a deep box and you can see that it's actually pretty full everything in one big bag lots and lots of parts all right yes everything in one big bag so get rid of the one big bag and then most of the sprues are separately bagged again inside there as you can see there are let's see one two three four five six seven sprues don't know how many parts this equates to but it looks like it's kind of a lot so Let's start out with these fuselage holes because they're already out. And what we've got here is rivets, 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 so many rivets, lots and lots and lots of surface detail. Have a look at that. All the rivets represented in various slightly different sizes and, and depths, which is quite a nice touch. It's not all, all the same size, shape and depth. The surface of the plastic is not perfectly smooth, but it's not rough enough to be an issue. And then as well as the recessed rivet detail, there's lots of raised detail as well. So this these panels and lots of others are actually raised which again is a really nice touch it sort of helps to give the sort of surface texture it gives it a lift when it's like that we do have a mold seam up here in fact let's clip these off and tape them together see how they look and it'll be easier to see all the different details and, and what have you so mini art have done this thing where the, whoop, where the sprue gates go onto the joint face. I'm not a massive fan of this this uh, this uh, method personally. I'm sure a lot of people are, but you just have to be a lot more careful cleaning these up. There we go, all cleaned up and taped together. Now my my parts have got a bit of a marked reluctance for the fin to squeeze together as a sort of a bit of warpage going on. But as you can hopefully see, signs are good that this thing with glue and a little bit of coaxing is going to fit together plenty well enough. Uh, and yeah, the plastic's very soft. Not immediately obvious when you look at the parts. I did think it looked like it was soft, which might sound like a weird thing to say. Um, but it actually is very soft, so care will be required. 
but yes it's 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 epically nicely molded there's some uh, wheelbay detail there and the wing root already and all of the various vents and openings and things are quite nicely reproduced this area here for instance very nicely done the this port here this isn't the exhaust this is the waste gate there's one each side uh, they should be open as in that should be a hole and that sort of bar you can see going through it is a representation of the actual valve oops i forgot to snip that bit off um, and you can also see it's very obvious just here one of the big drawbacks with this kind of surface detail and then standard moulding techniques is that this rivet date detail actually has to sort of peter out towards the join because of the angle of the mould. There's nothing that can really be done about that. It wouldn't come out of the mould otherwise. And you can see that in evidence all the way along. Note back here how these rivets or fasteners become, they start off being circles and they, and they turn into oblongs as they come along here. It's, it's inevitable uh, if if you're going to mould it as two halves these rivets fade away they do throughout the kit this is what happens it's also very obvious up there and that's why the likes of Katari uh, have the separate spine inserts and what have you it's so that they can mould the detail it, it, it's not specifically to get rid of seams although that is a nice side benefit it's so that they can keep the detail consistent across all the parts now at the front on the top here you can see you've got a very obvious mould line blemish both sides so there's a, a separate part to the mould here and note how much more crisp that detail is at the top compared to everywhere else that I've just showed you. Regardless of that these are normal injection moulding limitations we should all be familiar with them by now. Um, but just be aware that the price of having all this beautiful rivet detail is that you have to be prepared to reinstate it where necessary uh, and all the way along all the seams is going to be necessary even before you do joint line rectification but so far so good that's a great start let's get another another load of parts to look at so here what we've got engine all engine parts and in true mini art style it is really rather nicely done you got both all your banks of cylinders your intakes your exhausts push rods etc and loads of bits and pieces also a propeller which is in two sections Next up, more details and lots of them. Goodness gracious me, you've got wing inserts, we've got some cockpit parts, wheels, they are moulded in halves but the detail's quite nicely done and we've got a couple of options, it's the same wheel type but different tread types. So a sort of a, a block pattern and a diamond pattern there are offered. There's lots and lots of detail parts. So again, I'll just bring this up close. And you can just see the amount of detail and how nicely rendered it is throughout. I'm going to have to do some bag opening, excuse the sounds. Alright, so this one's got the wing panels on it and cowlings. Turn it the right way up. And again, this just absolutely wonderful surface detail with raised areas and recessed rivets, recessed panel lines, and it's beautifully done, really beautifully done. There's an insert for the top of the nose here, and then your cowlings. 
this is sort of the very front of the fuselage, so the far wall if you like. The only thing I would say, and I noticed this through the bags, I do think the panel lines on the lower wing panels are a bit a bit heavy, especially because they've got this line of rivet detail each side of them, which sort of enhances them visually to the point where they start to become distracting, I find. I'll bring you up close to see that in a second. We've got two different types of main undercarriage leg there. But if I show you this upper wing surface detail first, it's it's absolutely glorious, completely, completely beautiful throughout. Stunning stuff. But then if I move to the lower wing, you can see the difference in how pronounced those panel lines are. All of them, not just the main skin panels, but all the panels compared to this. If I go like that, you can perhaps see them all at once. Possibly just a bit overdone and I'm a tiny bit confused as to why they're so much more pronounced than these. It's even in the same mould, so a little odd. The rest of the detail is all as per. Some very nice moulded in details around the front of the fuselage there. Glorious. Stunning stuff. And yet more. So we can see you've got flying controls here and the carriage doors and the like. More detail parts, more cocktail, more cocktail, more cockpit parts. The seat has moulded in belts, which actually look really, really good. Okay, so let's start with a visible part of the turbo. It goes underneath the rear fuselage. It looks like it's in shadow to me, but you can clearly see the turbine wheel in there, beautifully moulded. And then we'll switch to some of these cockpit parts. See the moulded in belts there on the seat back. And then some more surface detail, and again you can see that contrast where the rudder here has got quite heavy looking panel lines compared to the ailerons. Again, just that slight inconsistency. And the mudder, mudder, the rudder is basically moulded as one part, just a little insert to go at the bottom, and that's to avoid sink marks. Insides of inside faces of the undercarriage doors again, stunningly detailed, beautiful, beautiful detail, and no ejector pin marks. That's a solid win, and we've got the uh, rudder pedals. Lots and lots of really beautiful detail. Um, just finally, wheel bay panels. Absolutely glorious. And the final sprue, there's two, I'll just take one out of the pack, but essentially, let's call it armaments and accessories. <laughs> so what we've got here um, one, two, three, four, five different sorts of drop tank two different sizes of bomb bigger bombs oh no, three different sizes so you've got a fat bomb, a slimmer bomb and smaller bombs I'm still wrong, there are four different sizes of bomb there uh, mortar tubes are they? rockets, mortar tubes and the detail on those end plates, I, I mean, I've seen worse resin parts. Astonishingly good. And here we've got sort of uh, sway braces and such, and various different, a couple of different wheel covers actually there. And yet another wheel option. This is, um, this is flattened, weight flattened, but it's not flat at the bottom, so it will still need sanding some. Um, which the other ones were not uh, and that's all the plastic parts which only leaves the transparencies 
This being the basic kit, there's no faux torch or anything else. Hmm. It's a little bit wobbly. The moulding around the edge of these parts is a little bit wobbly. It's probably going to need a bit of chewing up. And there's quite a lot of distortion in in the sort of clear area. I really don't know if that's going to translate. There, yeah, I think you can see that. Both the uh, windscreen and the main canopy, there's quite a lot of distortion when you look through them. There is not a seam though, I've got it on the top. Yeah. You don't have lights here, gun sight and a, and a ident lamp lens at the bottom. So, last and not least, instructions and decals over here. I've got two different decal sheets, we'll look at those in a minute. And an instruction booklet. All in colour. Relatively thin paper but glossy. So you've got a bit of a rendition of one of the markings options there. Again, it's reminding you this is the basic kit. So the first couple of pages, as per, we've got parts diagrams for the myriad of sprues uh, and the diagram for the deco sheet. A bit of nomenclature at the top. Now, Colour chart. Labelled throughout the instructions by the numbers on the left and then with translating into Vallejo. Mr. Colour. AK Real Colour. Mission Models. Ammo of MIG. Tamiya. And then a colour name with FS numbers where appropriate. So that is quite thorough. And those are the grey boxes you can see throughout. And here, straight away, this is just screaming mini art. <laughs> It's so complex looking, isn't it? A four part seat. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, it's uh, as I said, we've got moulded in seat belts on the back of the seat and the sides, and then there's a separate part, plastic, to add in there for seat belts. What a fabulous touch! I like that. With, with careful painting, they'll look just fine. There is even an oxygen hose included. So the first few stages just deal with building up that cockpit tub in the same style as both the Tamiya and the Asagawa kits, I have to say. Then you've got the tail wheel. Uh, not sure I've seen any other 48 scale World War II fighter kit that has six parts for the tail wheel assembly. That's pretty impressive. But you've got an option of the uncovered version and then the the version with the sort of canvas boot that covers the whole lot up. This is quite a nice touch but I wonder how practical it will be in reality because you do have to deal with that fuselage seam and paint around everything but the instructions showing the uh, aerial getting plugged in in that manner. So essentially this block sits behind, I'll bring it up a little closer, sits underneath the fuselage and it just pokes through but whether or not that's going to stay intact for the entirety of a build is uh, it's unlikely frankly. A few more bits of vents and what you, what have you added and then we glued the fuselage halves together and add the top decking. Then on to the engine again typical mini art why use one part when you can use eight but Mini Art do it in a way that's quite endearing and, and they generally tend to fit together very, very nicely. Um, I have only built one Mini Art kit thus far and it isn't finished in fairness, but if I just quickly show you. This is um, a 135th scale GMC truck that I'm, I've been working on. And uh, it's the same. There are so many parts in this chassis, it's untrue. But 
they all fit together beautifully so it just becomes fun rather than an irritation it for me anyway because i do enjoy the process of actually building kits so anyway i digress so we're going to build up this engine with the cowlings as a complete sort of power egg assembly then building up the wheelbase and again one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine parts to build up the wheel bay walls. There's no representation of the gun bays um, at, in, in this kit anyway. The machine gun barrels are fitted from the inside. Again, that's something uh, that I personally wouldn't want to do and what I would probably do is remove the barrels from this backing plate and fit the backing plate but then put the barrels back in from the front at the end or use master brass barrels anyway oh this is why we've got extra legs okay nice we've got separate undercarriage legs because one is to represent the chassis in normal condition and one is to represent it under load. So if you want your aircraft to represent one that's bombed up, fueled up, armed up and sat at dispersal ready to go, you're going to want to use the under load legs. Nice touch. Very nice touch. Popping the wings on. There are no wing spars. They're just butt joining on. And the undercarriage legs. And that's us done. Here we've got pylons, so arming them up. And they have pylons, and they also have a rendition for empty pylons. So if you want the pylons fitted but don't want to put bombs or drop tanks on, then you've got a good option for that as well. Now here we go through what we've got. We have a 108 gallon paper drop tank, 200 gallon drop tank, 150 gallon and 75. Then uh, 1,000 pounders in M65 and M59 form, 250 pounders and 500 pounders. And we can also have a smoke grenade. I've never even heard of that. And rocket launcher tubes. Common markings stencils displayed next. And then we get on to our markings options, of which there are two. First off, Hairless Joe, 62nd Fighter Squadron, 8th Air Force, August 1944. So this would have been based in the UK. Pilot Colonel David Schilling. And this is a great scheme, isn't it? <laughs> really colourful. Red nose, yellow tail, nose art. And cool stripy camo. And D-Day stripes. It's pretty much covering it all off there. You have different um decals to fit here on the national markings if your intakes are open or closed it tells you there which ones to use second option 82nd fighter squadron at duxford summer 1944 uh, a slightly more basic scheme this is your standard olive drab over neutral gray but it does have a checkerboard nose it does have d-day stripes and that white fin stripe so still visually quite striking and certainly very very well rendered on the instructions and then on the back page as you already saw earlier when i was looking for the paint number call outs you've got all your armaments uh the colors and the decals for them all right then let's look at the decals just to finish this part as i said we get two sheets so national markings first now it does say on the front of the box or somewhere definitely seen it yes on the side of the box that we've got cartograph decals which is generally a good thing so scientist glasses back on main markings they're quite simple there you know and beautifully printed exactly what you would expect 
Serial numbers, national markings, propeller stencils, a couple of other stencils, uh, a crew stencil, some um, kill markings. Interestingly, you do get the checkered cowl as decals. That is adventurous. I'm going to say. Not impossible, for sure, but certainly not going to be easy. Now, interestingly, there are some alignment markings on here. And there are also, which is probably not going to be able to see on the film. Ah, oh, that's what that is. So, cut marks. I'll try and show you if you can see really, really closely. Look where the dotted lines are. There are actually some very slight notches in the colour and I think the dotted lines are telling you to cut use a scalpel and slit along here and take that little wedge out because there is carrier film in the wedge so if you don't clear you know if you don't cut that out then it's not really going to work as advertised that is what the dotted lines are for however there isn't anything in the instructions that tells you that no, there isn't. You can see here, here's the scheme in question. No, there's nothing there to tell you to do that, but I've just spotted it, so there you go. You need to do that. There is also a really rather lovely uh, instrument panel decal and some cockpit placards. And there are a couple, three different types of instrument panel decals. So there is a fully printed one, which is gorgeous, here. So you can just apply that straight on the panel and think no more about it. Then there is a clear one with the dials only. So you can apply that and sort of paint around them or whatever. And then there is a dials only option. So they're already, there you go, separate. So you can install, install those one by one into that instrument panel the choice is yours so that's that one and then the secondary sheet actually is stencils and weapon markings and i really like the way they've broken this sheet up actually so you have top view so all the stencils you're going to need to do the top of the aircraft and i don't know about anybody else but i tend to do this i i if I've got a lot of stencils to do, and I'm hoping that by now you all realise that I, I really don't like doing stencils when there are a lot. But what I'll tend to do is, is, is get, let's get the instructions out and lay the model down in a similar orientation. So I'll do the top and I'll just have the top diagram to hand and I'll literally work around it logically like so one by one by one until they're all done and I cross them out as I go. With this, instead of having to hunt around the sheet for each separate one and try and cut it out, I can just cut this entire piece out and know that that's all the decals for the top bit. And it goes on bottom, right and left. I like that a lot and that is pretty much exactly how I work when I do these things. So that the designer obviously has a similar <laughs> mindset to me. Um, then we've got pylon decals, tank decals and bomb decals. Again, all neatly labelled and very obvious what they are. Like that, that's a very nice touch. And very nice decals all in actually. Good little set that is. And I don't really think, as long as you're happy with these marking options, I don't really think there's any need to look at replacing those. So that's everything looked at. But what I want to do just to sort of finish off is a bit of a comparo because... There are decent P47 kits out there and I'm only going to talk about the decent ones and by that I mean the Hasegawa kit and the Tamiya kit. So the Hasegawa kit was released in 1996 and I've got a couple of them here. Um, this is the fuselage from the bubble top variant which I just use as a mule. I just um, paint and stuck a bit of foil on it there. I just, uh, this was testing out some chrome paint, which as you can see doesn't really look at anything like chrome. Uh, and immediately looking at them, what can you see? Well, the Hasegawa, the finish on the parts is spectacular, and that's something they were always very good at. 
but there's no rivets all the panel line detail is there and in fact the raised panelling in some instances as well uh, but no rivets and what the Hasegawa kit also has is just this beautiful consistency of detail it, it, it's it's the same everywhere. You've not got deep panel lines one place and shallow ones in another. It's 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 metronomic, but it's perfect. Um, and then the Tamiya kit. So I have a Tamiya kit. It's not finished yet. It's one I've just been mucking about with. If I just pop the wings back off, note that it has wing spars. I mean, I'd like to finish it one day, but I've I've literally just been. I was messing about with uh, foil finishes and um, paint actually but you can see let's put them all the same there try and line them up they all look broadly similar don't they nothing standing out as being horrible about either of them, any of them the Tamiya kit was released in 2003 it's still widely available um, and is one, uh, it's one of the newer sort of golden period Tamiya kits so the panel lines and what have you aren't quite just as heavy as on some of the slightly older ones um, in fact it it matches up really well to the Hasegawa kit in that respect but has better detail and then if I try when with the addition of extra fingers somehow bring the mini art one up into the mix as well there you go so what do you gain with the mini art kit compared to these two? It's, it's detail basically. I have a finished Hasegawa kit. This, this is it here. And this is actually the first Thunderbolt and um, so far only Thunderbolt model I've ever completed. I bought a, a selection of sort of part started nonsense for, from Vincent Models for sale which included these all three of these p47s actually um and i you know it was just one of those where i started building it it was already partly put together i started working on it enjoyed it and just kept going until it was finished and this is the result and i really don't think you can argue that that is a solid thunderbolt model there's absolutely nothing wrong with it there we go it's got sensible amount of wheel well detail it certainly isn't amazing but it's decent likewise the and the propeller spins because of polycaps the cockpit detail it, it's decent it isn't it's not stunning or amazing it's decent the Tamiya is better detail wise than the Hasegawa kit but it's really there's genuinely nothing wrong with this kit it, it builds up into a, a nice rendition the Tamiya kit as I say it does have better detail in the cockpit as it comes which you probably can't see um, I've been working about with foil on this as you can also see so obviously the finish I will get to eventually is the the two blues um, and as I say I, w I was using it really as a test bed for foil finishing techniques which include also using paint which is what, what this is all about but again it's such a nice kit and such a nice rendition that I don't doubt at some point that I will finish this So yeah, what the mini art kit brings to the party compared to these two is detail. The, neither of these are riveted, as, as, as I've said. Um, the detail in both of them is adequate, but it's not spectacular. In fact, I've fitted the, uh, <laughs> I've actually fitted the deck of seat belts on this one. Uh, this kit, in comparison, the surface detail is is phenomenal, and it will bring a, a whole new. Uh, sort of aspect to any finished model that the sort of complex surface detail that we've got on these modern kits it just it does elevate the look of the kit it when complete even if it's not strictly speaking technically accurate because it's massively over scale and rivets aren't dimples and all the rest of it it still just brings an air of authentic authenticity to the look of the finished model which I suppose there's an element of personal preference some people don't like it some people will prefer this this style of presentation uh, but when you put the two side to side there's a, there's a definite difference in the look and it just just has that sort of that look of 
complicatedness that real aircraft quite often have when you look at them closely with all the panels and all the rivets and all the edges of everything that these kind of models don't really get that across whereas these really really can so it brings that it's also not a bad price it seems to be available anywhere from 33 to sort of 40 odd pounds uh, at the top end of that price range clearly it's more expensive than either of these two I think the P47 might the Tamiya one might have just been re-released with a with a Jeep actually has to go one good luck finding one but you're not really going to pay much less than 30 quid for either of them so if you're buying this one for 33 to 35 pounds it does actually stand out as being a good deal in comparison because of all that extra detail that's in the package already there's really I don't think it looks like there's any real need for aftermarket with this mini art kit. Anyway, gone on a bit there, haven't I? <coughs> Just an excuse to show you my lovely Thunderbolt, wasn't it? I certainly think that the three of them together could make quite a striking little uh, display piece. Uh, I do need to get another one to have a full natural metal build, don't I? And there you go anyway that's it that's the mini art p47d dash 25 re i don't doubt that mini art will offer extra and different variants in due course obviously the tamiya and hasegawa kits both offer the razorback version mini art currently do not but i'm sure that they will at some point i think it looks phenomenal I've seen a lot of uh, I've seen a few reviews pop up on on the YouTube already with sort of best kit ever kit of the year kind of headlines. I don't know about that. It's 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 certainly up there, but I wouldn't have said it was any better than the likes of the Armour Hobby Hurricane, for example. Um, it's certainly a signpost for the way modern manufacturing and new 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 tooled kits are going. Um, and actually, I welcome that, especially at the relatively sensible price that Mini Art are offering this version. Um, it does look great in the box. There is a lot of detail, but as I said, my experience of other Mini Art kits is that that's not a major drawback. It's just a little bit time consuming with the sort of preparation and, and everything of all the separate little parts. But the end result with care does look spectacular. So looking forward to seeing a few of these built. I think they're going to look really, really good. So there it is, brand new tool P47 from MiniArt. Looks amazing. Uh, I hope this was useful to some of you if you were wondering what was in the box and whether it was worth the investment. Hopefully you can now see that it very much looks like it is. Um, thanks again to Andy Hills from Antics Online for sending this across. Um, do think about giving him a look if you fancy buying one. And thanks again to everybody as ever for your continued support of the channel in all of the ways in all of the ways that you offer it. I do very much appreciate it. And with all of that said, it only remains for me to say, look after yourselves, look after each other, and Genesis out. There's a quick PS on this video which I forgot to mention earlier. I had I had it in mind to mention throughout the video, but the P47 it's never been an aircraft that's unduly inspired me in the past. Uh, American types, on the whole, pretty much heresy coming or incoming, <laughs> pretty much leave me cold. Um, but when I built the the Hasegawa one I've just shown you, one of the things I was doing whilst building it was watching a series of videos on YouTube. I have a, an iPad on my desk, and I quite often have videos playing in the background from a channel called Greg's Airplanes and Automobiles and this guy I believe is an airline pilot or pilot of some description um, and he puts out videos on mostly World War II aircraft all sorts of them really detailed in-depth well-researched technical videos um, and the P-47 really is something of an engineering work of art especially for its time um, the way it's packaged it is an enormous aircraft compared to some of the others but when you see why it's that big and what's inside it it really is an eye opener it's very very impressive so on the set on on the channel and i'll try and remember to link it below there is a 10 video series on the p47 where he looks in depth 
at the design choices, the construction, the performance characteristics, everything. And he does this for lots of different aircraft. It's a brilliant channel if you're interested in the technical uh, features and the engineering behind these aircraft and actually real life performance data as opposed to uh, mythical blown up stuff that people say. It's all research from period documentation and everything. It's, it's absolutely brilliant and it's really good stuff to have on in the background because it's it's almost more of a podcast. The visual element of it is is less. Uh, but yeah, seriously brilliant. The P-47 really is a, a, a mechanical masterpiece um, and when you start to appreciate the the real nuts and bolts of the real thing working on the model kind of takes on a life of its own and becomes more more interesting uh, but I, I just wanted to share that and share the channel it's well worth a look uh, as I say for anybody who's interested in sort of the engineering behind these aircraft that, that we like to build in plastic.